Okay, I'd like to get started. I know it's a little bit early to get started, but um, I wanted to make an explanation first. Um, well, this is the rough cut, IOE rough cut series on Bruce Maxwell. Um, today we're, we're trying an experiment, a little different approach, and that the idea is to have a principal investigator in the lab and give a little context and then have students fill in some sort of details of research in the project. So um, we don't know if this could be squeezed into an hour. That will be the interesting, one of the interesting parts, but also just how well it works in terms of, of being able to, to communicate some ideas. I think based on the on the time constraints, we're going to try to wait till the end to have questions though. Oh, no. <laughs> That's <laughs> why. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so today we have uh, Dave McQuethy and his lab group is here today. We're just going to introduce them, but he'll be the one. He's the PI. He's going to give us a little context. He's uh, an assistant professor in the uh, uh, earth science department and has uh, a project on a number of things, but certainly earth, wind, and fire. <laughs> Nice. Um, so why don't you take it away since we're just right at time. All right, thanks Bruce. Yeah, really excited to uh, feature some of the work uh, being done in the lab by our students and not everyone, in, uh, not all the grad students in the lab are gonna present today just because they're in different places in their program, but uh, we're gonna get a nice selection here. And yeah, Earth, Wind and Fire, I should have added Pike in there, but it just didn't, <laughs> we are going to talk about Pike today. Uh, Peter, I don't want to be left out. So, um, could you cue the music? <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, to try to to bring our lab group under one umbrella of some overarching ideas. Uh, you know, we, we're all looking at even the, the Pika expert here. We're all looking at how uh, organisms, organisms, and ecosystems respond to uh, disturbance whether that's natural or human caused. And uh, we are um, lucky in some senses that we're living in very dynamic times. So disturbance regimes are changing rapidly around the world. So there's a lot of good questions to ask, um, a lot of great things to investigate and, and see how different ecosystems are responding in, uh, around the world. So I'll just to kind of whet your appetite here. Um, So I'm not sure if you've all seen the car fire, any videos, but um, this is the one of the kind of fire NATO type phenomena that uh, occurred in the California fires, um, in this case, the car fire. And if you look at this video, you can see this is quite a, a dynamic event. And um, as a paleoecologist, it's hard to say that, um, this is completely uh, unprecedented, but that's what folks are calling this, this type of um, fire NATO is. You need, oh, do you need to do that? Yeah. Oh, sorry, okay, I screwed up, all right. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> this type of uh, fire and, and the fire weather that's created by the fire itself is not a common occurrence. You see a uh, pyrocumulus clouds forming, saw that in 1988 in Yellowstone, um, these large fires, but this type of uh, severe fire behavior is something that's relatively new in the last, you know, 100 years or so. Um, I'm sure if we went back to the Holocene, these things might have happened occasionally. Um, thank you. But, um, you know, this is the kind of uh, event that we should be preparing for in the future because of uh, changes in the baseline uh, bio uh, physical template on Earth, and I'm going to talk about that during my section here. And one of the main changes that's happening, and this is just one example, is that with uh, warming temperatures, just kind of uh, first principle physics here, that for every um, one degree Celsius rise, we had seven percent more moisture um, in terms of the main convective currents, uh, uh, convective uh, activity around the earth that's associated with the Hadley cells. So what's happening um, around the tropics 
is you get an enhanced Hadley cell, a lot of them are vertical of uh, energy. It's actually narrowing in its width, but its uh, vertical energy is much higher. But the descending portion of the Hadley cell is spreading out. So what you have is increased precipitation around the tropics and actual drying um, in the subtropics. And that's moving poleward in both the North and, and Southern Hemisphere. Um, so it shifts the rain bearing westerlies uh, where, where the uh, Hadley cells are descending further poleward in both the North and South. And then has a lot of important implications for the distribution of precipitation globally. And this is kind of the pattern that we're already observing. This is a projection, but we're already seeing this pattern where you get enhanced precipitation around the tropics. Again, it's not this nice, neat uh, band of enhancement, but it's, it's generally around the tropics and also the poles, and a pretty severe drying in the subtropics. Um, so essentially, the rich get richer. If you've already got moisture, you're going to get more. If you're dry, you're going to dry further, and the drying is going to shift further forward. When we talk about extreme climate, uh, just another example here, it, it kind of follows suit. That extreme precipitation events are going to follow this kind of enhancement in the tropics and uh, an extreme drying uh, events in the subtropics. One of the interesting things about this is that we have more extreme rainfall events. Mean annual rainfalls could be similar. Uh, they're not necessarily going to um, you know, rain more everywhere, even though you have more extreme events, it's gonna have more extreme events that are further uh, spaced out, which places like Montana, that could be really uh, challenging for um, the ag industry or the ranchers. Uh, you know, the same kind of trend with temperatures, we've got uh, obviously all the models are in agreement that we're gonna have warming around the globe. It's, uh, it's different you know, in terms of the extremes but extreme events are also expected to rise. More dry days, more extreme temperature events. So what does this mean for disturbance? Um, well, just a couple examples. In the Northern Rockies, are projecting upwards of 500, 600, 700% increases in annual area burn. If you look over here, um, this is median percent change in annual area burn. And if you look at Montana, we're talking 900, uh, to a thousand percent increase. Idaho is over a thousand. So these are very dramatic changes in the disturbance regime in terms of uh, at least annual area burned. And then there are other uh, synergistic uh, disturbances like uh, the, the probability of mountain pine beetles. So you've got fire, pine beetle, drought all interacting. So a lot of really significant changes going on with disturbance in, in the western U.S. So kind of our overarching questions are, how are ecosystems responding to these changes? And how can we use past um, paleoecological data to really help us prepare for uh, the future? What can we do? So our, uh, our research kind of spans a lot of sites around the globe. Most of the research is in Montana. But uh, one of the, I think, most powerful um, things about having research in different ecosystems around the world that we can really um, compare how disturbance regimes are changing across important biophysical gradients, you know, desert to rainforest. And that we can learn a lot from that in terms of preparing for the future. So uh, we've got research all over Montana, mostly Western Montana. Um, Greg Peterson gave a talk on our ice patch archaeology work, so I'm not going to talk about that today. We have a, a really neat project looking at social ecological resilience to wildfire in the Bitterroot and the Methow Valley in, in Washington um, with a group from the University of Montana. But today, uh, the students are just going to talk about these four projects, and they'll kind of get into those in detail. So these are the students that I'm working with. and. Uh, Matt and Shelby are going to hold off and present their take home later, and you'll hear from the rest of these folks. And I'm just going to kind of kick off with um, some highlights from some work I've been doing in Chile 
uh, with a, a great group of collaborators. And it happened to kind of co-occur uh, with the largest fires ever recorded in, in Chilean history, which were last year in 2017. And uh, Bryce is on this project, which is kind of exciting to have him here today. So in 2017, in central Chile, um, over a million and a half acres burned, uh, affecting thousands of communities throughout central Chile, displacing tens of thousands of people, uh, were really unprecedented in, in, in modern history in Chile. You can see from the, the satellite data of, of area burned and then the number of fires in, in the black line here, um, from 2000 to 2017, 2017 fires, uh, as recorded by the For Chilean Forest Service and satellite imagery, um, you know, they were, they were through the roof. So we wanted to know what are the primary factors that control the spatial distribution of wildfire in central Chile? And then specifically, what factors led to the, this unprecedented event? And what are the implications for the future of communities in Chile and ecosystems? So the first thing that we did uh, was just to really look at the spatial distribution of fires and look at what are the main variables that explain the spatial distribution. Really basic questions like, you know, what are the biophysical variables, um, different proxy for uh, human uh, footprint, and just land cover, you know, the fuel type that are, it's on the landscape. So we looked at um, these variables in using uh, general, generalized additive models and uh, land and forest models. And what you'd expect to explain the, the distribution of, of fires for the last couple of decades, you know, we find that lower elevations, um, modestly dry settings, not the driest because the fuel continuity is lower, not the wettest because the fuel is generally wet. Um, and then areas that were covered by highly flammable vegetation, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, um, explain where you had the greatest amount of fire. And if you look at this, this is the model, uh, this is based on the random forest model that we, that's very similar to the GAM model we came up with. The highest probability of fire are in these lower elevation settings with highly flammable fuels um, that have moderate levels of rainfall and uh, moderate population density. One of the really big things that came out of this paper we published in, in um, PLOS with, with Bryce um, is the importance of this transition of vegetation in central Chile that occurred uh, most dramatically starting in the 1970s, where you had 78% of, of native forest loss in many of these central Chilean <laughs> districts. Um, and these native forests transitioned to exotic forest plantations of eucalyptus and, and pinus, and also some uh, shrubland and, and ag land. This transition has had very severe consequences for wildfire uh, in Chile. And what we found with our modeling is that if we looked at uh, this Murdoch index, which essentially is a forage selection index, it, it asks, um, is, does fire have a selective preference for a certain vegetation type um, that's disproportionate with how much of the landscape it covers. And uh, plantation forests, both eucalyptus and pinus, were through the roof in terms of the strong selective preference for wildfire to spread in these um, land cover types over any other. And you see just in terms of the proportions, this is the proportion of area burned, and this is the proportion of landscape that's occupied by uh, pine and eucalypt plantations. Um, it kind of demonstrates this strong selective uh, preference. So take home here is that you now have all this brown are these uh, non-native plantations. You now have highly flammable forests that have provide continuous fuels all over central Chile. So when you do get dry conditions, you get a fire starting to burn, you've got all this flammable fuel to burn. And that's, it's certainly influencing and promoting fire spread and, and was contributed to the 2017 fires. So the next kind of question that we wanted to ask 
was what are the broad scale climate conditions that are responsible for exceptionally high you know, fire uh, burn barrier years. So one of the trends that um, Rene uh, Garo, who we're working with uh, from the University of Chile and uh, others have seen is this kind of perpetual drying or this extended drought that's been occurring in central Chile uh, since the 1980s. Now, they just, uh, Rene and others just published a paper on the 2010-2015 mega drought, which was even uh, more severe than this 1980 to 2010 plot. And, uh, you know, that's had a, a huge consequences for, uh, you know, annual area burned and, and wildfire. And what's responsible for this kind of drying trend gets back to the Hadley cell expansion. So what's happening is the, the subsidence of the Hadley cell is pushing, is expanding and, and moving further south, and it's pushing the storm track further into Patagonia. So you're not getting any of the, the, the storms that used to hit central Chile are now being pushed further south. This is interacting with um, southern annual mode, which I won't get into, but it's another teleconnection that uh, kind of enhances this pull of the storm track further south. So the combination of a positive SAM and this expansion of the Hadley cell is really going to have um, great consequences for central Chile. It's already been causing uh, partial responses for this drought, but the projections for the future is just going to continue on for decades. So uh, with this group from the University of Chile and uh, Portland State University, we've, we've got this paper we're working on right now. We're documenting the kind of broad scale climate conditions that are associated with exceptionally high fire years, or high area burn. And what you see is that you've got this high pressure system out in the Pacific off the coast of Chile, which is uh, reflecting storms further from uh, central Chile. You're not getting storms uh, in this area. In the low fire years, you see there's a big low um, over central Chile pulling storms uh, into that area. So it's kind of uh, not surprising that this is the setup for really high years and really low fire years. When we look at um, other variables, temperature by far comes out as the strongest explanatory variable for um, the broad scale climate conditions that promote fires in, in those exceptionally high years. That's not a surprise, but we were surprised that it's, it's much stronger than precipitation, at least for that year. When we look at plots for 2017, we see that you know, some of the basic conditions promoting large fire, the surface air temperature was extremely high. Um, for the January, which is when most of the fires occurred. And the relative humidity was extremely low. So these are, you know, they're not uh, earth shattering results, but this hasn't been documented and, and we're trying to really come up with, can we use this information to forecast when we're gonna have another year like 2017? And one of the, the most interesting results that we found is that uh, with the 2017 fires and these exceptionally uh, bad fire years, we have this setup that uh, Renee, who's a climatologist, has been working on this uh, a lot, has, has never really seen before. And what it is, is you, you have this uh, situation where you get a high pressure system sitting out here and actually results in a weakening of the westerlies. And this is also enhanced by the SAM, the positive SAM, where you get uh, an offshore, a subsidence off the Andes, and all this warm air coming out the Andes is uh, pushing down to the lowlands of central Chile and creating incredible fast and, and hot fires. And uh, you know, in California, we have the Diablo and the Santa Ana winds that are it's a similar phenomenon. But in central Chile, we really you really don't see that because in California you have a high pressure system out here that's driving the Santa Ana and uh, Diablo easterlies. Yeah. The, the offshore wind, the warm offshore winds. But in Chile, that's not really uh, something you see every year like you would see in autumn or winter in California. But uh, when you have this setup, it's, uh, it's really uh, 
forecasting and you could have an incredibly bad fire year. So just to kind of wrap up, um, you know, this projection is for the effects of the Hadley cell expansion and the substance for central Chile is really into the, into the next 100 years or so. It's, it's going to continue to dry out and we're going to, you're going to eventually see the shift in Mediterranean vegetation further south into Chile. And second, right now we've got much of central Chile has transitioned to these plantation forests, just a highly flammable vegetation. So that, that combination is, um, is going to promote a lot of fire activity in, in decades to come. The, the, I'm going to be going to Chile at the end of the semester and uh, working with folks. The other questions that we're asking are, how are Araucaria forests, a really important um, ecosystem in Chile, how are they how are they regenerating uh, following repeated fires? Um, we're going to be doing an Araucaria planting experiment in some of the most severely burned areas. And then we're also looking at how uh, the, the 2017 fires are affecting both ecosystems that are dominated by exotic assemblages and those that are, are dominated by native uh, flora. So we're seeing is there a difference in terms of the recovery and resilience of kind of these these native and non-native systems. So uh, I'm gonna pass this on to uh, our first student, Pico, and let her take it away. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm gonna talk um, about research that we're doing, which is a little bit closer to home. So this is taking place in the Mission Mountain Range um, on the Flathead Indian Reservation. And a number of us in the lab are a part of this project, as well as Greg Peterson, Emily Haradell, and Rick Everett. And what we're doing is we're using fire scars, tree rings, and lake sediment scores to put together a fire history of the region. And um, specifically kind of looking at if we can see any human influence on um, fire regimes and the forest structure. So this is a map of the Flathead Indian Reservation. The red sites, we have a suite of lakes that we're taking um, lake sediment cores from and doing tree ring research. The red, um, the red sites have been classified as areas of intensive early human use sites, and the blue ones had limited early use sites. The way that was designated was through um, oral histories of known travelways, cultural sites, and archaeological information. And our main research questions for the whole project are how variable were fire regimes in mixed conifer forests of the northern Rocky Mountains? Where and how did ancient management influence past fire regimes and forest ecosystems? And are restoration efforts representative of historical processes and conditions? So we ultimately help to um, kind of put the manage current management processes in context, in a horse historical context. Um, so my part of this is looking at lake sediment cores. And so what we do is we go to a lake and we collect lake sediments. <laughs> um, and they go back, they can go back as far as to the late glacial period. This is a lake sediment core from Twin Lake. Um, at the end on the right is a tephra also in the middle of that one core. That is from Mount Mazama, um, an eruption around 7,700 years ago. So we can use that as a good chronological restraint. It's really Good to see in the field because then you know that you've gone at least that far. Um, and then once we get it back to the lab, we'll look for macro fossils that we can further radiocarbon date and then put an age depth model for the entire core where we um, assign a age for every single depth. And then we'll look at the charcoal. We'll count all the charcoal particles of every single centimeter of core to put together a fire history. And we'll look at the pollen changes over time to see how the vegetation has changed. And then we're additionally now looking at biomarkers, which are compounds that are produced in the gut of humans and mammals, and they're preserved in sediments. Uh, so you can analyze these and try to get a better record of human presence on your landscape. So I'm going to talk to you quickly about two sites, Black Lake and Twin Lakes. Black Lake, they're both low elevation lakes. Black Lake is dominated by ponderosa pine, duck fir, but it also has larch and a little bit of spruce around. Um, the 
some uh, along the water edge suggest that there have been lake level fluctuations in the past. So maybe during colder and wetter periods, or wetter periods rather. Twin Lake similarly is a low elevation lake, um, also in a mixed conifer forest of Douglas fir, larch, ponderosa pine, and grand fir, spruce, and liver pine. So all sorts of um, diversity in conifer trees there. So this is just a couple of representative pollen um, samples or things that I picked out to talk about in the charcoal diagram on the bottom. We have age coming from 15,000 on the left going to present day on the right. The orange bar in the middle represents the summer insulation maximum around 10,000 years ago where a bunch of pollen records in the northern, in the northern Rockies and Twin Lake as you can see kind of show a decrease in conifer pollen and increase in grass, suggesting that perhaps trees had moved, migrated upslope. I'm gonna focus on where Black Lake and Twin Lake kind of start to come in together because Black Lake didn't extend past 7,000 years ago. So as you can see, this green line represents arboreal to non-arboreal pollen ratio. So coming out of this warm period, they show a similar um, increase in arboreal pollen. So that's your conifers and large shrubs as opposed to little shrubs and herbs and grasses. So suggesting that the forest was coming back down to lower elevations once it was cooling and um, not as dry. This is similarly represented by an increase or a decrease in the grasses at both sites. This is a record of spruce and in both of the sites, you see this little bump around 4,000 years ago in spruce, which is an indicator of colder conditions. So that could suggest that there was a slight or a little neoglacial period, which has been seen in other glacial advances in British Columbia, et cetera. So this could be possible evidence of that. Um, but regardless, it just suggests a cooler and wetter environment. Um, I'm gonna skip over the top one for sake of time, but we're gonna look back now at the charcoal record. Um, so around 6,000 years ago, once the forest was coming back down to lower elevations or there was a decrease in grassland, we're seeing a huge increase in charcoal. And that we believe is just representative of the fact that there's more biofuel to burn. There's more trees to burn with <laughs> the, um, with the forest around. Um, what's interesting is that going towards present day at Twin Lake, there is an increase in fire frequency, so just the number of fire events, which is hard to see, but represented by those black crosses on the bottom. Um, there's an increase in those, and at Black Lake, there's also an increase in just charcoal accumulation um, in the late Holocene, at this time when pollen suggests that things were getting colder and wetter. So what does that tell us? Um, we're still in the early stages of things, but that could be a signal of either increased climate variability or human, is it a sign of human churning? So our main conclusions are just that there is an open woodland grassland at low elevations during a dry or mid Holocene. Modern forests established around 3000 years ago after this colder wetter period around 4000. There's an increase in woody biomass burning which coincided with a transition to closed forests around 5,500 years ago. And then this fire activity increase in the late Holocene, is that a sign of intentional burning? So one way that we're trying to hope, focus in on this, which is part of our next steps, is that we are getting biomarker <coughs> analysis, biomarker analysis, and um, John's gonna talk more about that um, following me. And so we have um, samples from all of these lakes currently getting processed and analyzed. So we're hoping to get that record soon and see if there's any presence of humans that we can um, and then we're also going to compare it with additional early human use, uh, limited early human use sites and intensive early use sites to see if there's um, how they compare to the charcoal records. Um, and that's it. Thank you. I'm going to pass this on to John. All right, Dave told me not to go on down too many tangents, so if I start doing that, just give me a sign or something. <laughs> um, so I'm interested in, uh, you know, like Dave mentioned, these how humans have affected disturbance processes. Um, not only have humans like 
had an effect on creating larger, more impactful disturbances. We've also, you know, had an impact the other way where we've kind of excluded systems from disturbances. So um, I'm interested in, you know, how in the northern Rocky Mountains, northern Great Plains, how this disturbance dynamic is playing out. Uh, we see right here that there's these, you know, throughout North America, ecosystems are experiencing rapid um, woody cover um, kind of expansions, especially in the southern and central Great Plains. We don't have any sites in this study from the northern Great Plains where we are, but you expect that these drier, these drier systems like the and Desert and Sonoran Desert, even though they're um, a little bit drier, still woody uh, expansion taking place there. And uh, so a couple of the drivers that we think are um, kind of triggering this change. Uh, human use, human land uses have changed, obviously. Um, there used to be a lot let more landscape connectivity that would carry fires um, over the landscape. There, um, since then we've implemented fire suppression policies. We've um, kind of enclosed ecosystems and intensively graze them to reduce fuel continuity. And also we've implemented just fire suppression policies. So that on top of you know, changing climate where we expect in this region warmer temperatures and um, more precipitation and even higher CO2 levels, we'll all kind of, we tend to think that um, those factors will influence woody encroachment positively, resulting in um, more open forest and less grassland throughout the region. So, how do, so I have three questions. Um, the first one deals more with these long-term changes, um, looking into the past to understand the present, right? How do herbivory and fire interact to, um, with climate to influence ecosystem structure and competition? A composition of forest grassland ecotones. Um, then, like Pico mentioned, I'm going to be looking into biomarkers and see if we can start to establish relationship between um, the biomarkers that we find in lake sediments and how many herbivores we know are actually on the land at a, at a given point in time. And what are the consequences of these altered disturbance regimes for, um, you know, in terms of grazing and fire for vegetation in the northern Great Plains and uh, northern Rockies. That's going to be a little bit more of a, a modeling big picture approach. So I'm starting, I'm in my first year, but I'm starting off my work at the National Bison Range, which has two sites that we were able to extract uh, pretty quality cores from. We have Looper Pond and Ravali Pothole, so right here and here. and. Ravali pothole is thought to be formed about 13,000 years ago when the glacial lake Missoula drained and there's all this turbulence going over that pass and it plucked out some of the rocks and formed that feature. So we have these two sites that date back to about glacial lake Missoula, right? And then also um, there's some fire scar sites, which are those red triangles. Those are, um, we're, we're planning to expand our fire scar sampling effort to reconstruct <laughs> you know, fire history um, at the National Bison Range over the past several hundred years. So like Pico mentioned, we can, when we extract a core, we can subsample it for all these different proxies of different environmental processes. Um, so TEFRA we can use to provide some age constraints, pollen and charcoal, vegetation and fire, and then biomarkers, like I mentioned. Um, we're really excited. So Dave's work has already involved caprostanol, which is used to quantify human impacts um, in the past. And also um, people have used similar biomarkers that are slightly different for herbivores, but only in um, kind of domestic grazing systems. So this is the first time I think anyone's gonna try to apply it for wild, herb wild herbivores. So some nice site pictures here. Looper Pond, which is on the west side of the National Bison Range. That definitely wasn't us, that was definitely bison. Um, <laughs> and uh, the fire scars, they're just over the hill from Rivali Pothole. And that core is a little less exciting, but sometimes not exciting is good. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that makes the National Bison Range interesting to work at is just the kind of the richness of the history 
uh, some of the last bison in North America, they were um, in the area. And uh, eventually people um, like Hornaday, they gathered all the bison up and they're like, we need to you know, restock the plains basically with bison. Um, so these were being rounded up on the west part of the reservation and brought over to its small town to be shipped off to Canada um, where they currently have herds. And uh, some of the remnant herd at the National Bison Range, about 30 animals, they were left behind. And uh, it looks like this, I'm not totally sure, but it looks like this picture is uh, actually of my site of one of the Raleigh potholes. So like I said, there's a pretty rich history. We also have you know, annual reports of you know, different events going on on the range. I was really interested in understanding how fire has changed and how that compares to um, our actual fire scar record. So this was in 1934, there was a big fire that took out um, much of the range. It didn't quite take it out, but uh, it did leave some record in our fire scars. So that's 1934. This is, is the fire scars at uh, that Trisky Creek site. And we do have, let's see, seven out of the eight trees <coughs> recording a burn on that year. So fire scars do indicate low to moderate severity fires. This fire didn't kill any of those trees. Um, and if we compare that to our sediment charcoal record, we'll see that well, as we expect sediment charcoal, there has to be pretty high charcoal production in order for a fire to be detected in that. So it doesn't produce a huge spike, which uh, it's kind of cool to compare those two proxies and then say, you know, be able to interpret more of what the charcoal record long-term is saying based on the fire scars. And of interest to us is this period here from about 550 years ago to 250. Uh, it corresponds about to the Little Ice Age, which is thought to have been a, a cooler and wetter period. So, you know, that suggests there's a lot more, you know, severe fire really immediately close to our site. And uh, we're curious to parse out whether that's a, a climate signal alone or if humans were involved in that burning as well. So, like I said, I'm pretty early on in the process, so I have a lot of work ahead of me. Um, you know, continuing to reconstruct past fire, vegetation, herbivore impacts, climate, all these things that um, these lower grassland ecotones throughout the, um, at the National Bison Range and beyond. Um, we're really inter interested and excited to see how this um, you know, kind of calibration study works out between our biomarkers and the great records that we have of populations for bison at the National Bison Range at Yellowstone, at Elk Island in Alberta. And um, we're also looking forward to some of the collaborations we have to um, incorporate herbivory into a dynamic kind of ecosystem model that um, has never been applied to this, this part of the world. Um, it's developed in Africa and um, we're pretty excited to see how herbivory and all these other ecosystem processes kind of interact on a large scale. And I'll pass it off to Nick. Perfect. Thanks, John. Thank you all for coming out. I'm really excited to get to share a little sliver of my research with you guys. Um, so as Pico mentioned, um, you know, across the Flathead Reservation, we have these different sites that kind of span this gradient of low to high elevation and different intensities of land use. Um, so these guys have been working on pulling and constructing histories from these lake sediment cores. Where I come in is um, looking at the mixed conifer forests around each of these lakes and sampling those forests and kind of building these uh, triggering records for these different sites. And at two of the sites in particular, as I started working here, um, we noticed really healthy white bark pine populations. And that got me personally very excited. I love white bark pine as a forester. Um, so I was really excited to see this opportunity and kind of ask some specific questions related to this really uh, interesting species. So with that, I'm gonna jump into kind of my broad questions that are motivating my entire research. And these are very broad. These are basically chapters in my dissertation research. So the first one here, is I'm um, really interested in physiology, specifically growth of these trees and investment into resin duct defenses, which are thought to be a nice proxy for defense. Um, the, the, you know, it's, resin ducts are associated with the production and kind of mobilization of resin in these trees. So if trees have lots of resin ducts, then 
theory is that they're gonna be more defended against disturbance events. Um, so I was curious if trees that are currently live and trees that have died recently at these sites, if there was any differences you know, between growth and these resident dug properties for these uh, paired samples. That's kind of my first question. Um, my second question is looking at specifically disturbance legacies. And what I'm really thinking about is uh, different fire histories. So low, moderate, and high severity fires. We have plots in different kind of fire intensity regions. Um, so my goal is to look at uh, you know, growth and physiology, growth and defense at White Park across these different sites as well uh, to see if there's any uh, variation. And then my most recent kind of uh, uh, rabbit hole I'm dropping down is looking at chemical defenses in White Park pine. Um, kind of across the species in relation to lodgepole pine, another very prominent uh, forest tree out there, and to see if there's um, any potential variation with this you know, chemistry, so the production of these mono and diterpenes, and um, uh, competition around the tree. So we take actually some competition data for these individuals, and um, we're kind of in the midst of that um, work right now. So a lot there. So today I'm really just going to be focusing on that first question, kind of this mortality question of these live and dead pairs of white bark pine. Um, so we had to first identify the trees, which was a challenge, um, because they had to share some period of common interval. There had to be some period of overlap between the live and the dead trees. Uh, so a lot of potentially awesome looking dead trees weren't viable uh, pairs for my live trees. Um, but basically we paired based on um, uh, diameter, so no, no greater difference than two centimeters in dBH. And we also paired based on distance. So all these trees were within 20, 25 meters of each other. And really the reason for doing that was just to try to control for microsite differences. There's a lot of variability in some of these plots. So we were trying to minimize that as much as possible. Um, so the first one I'm gonna talk about is Three Lakes Peak, kind of in the Southern uh, range on the reservation. And um, kind of my first two years here, we're sampling these sites uh, because this is part of a larger project. So we're really looking at demography kind of across these different sites. So we're developing species composition. We're looking at mortality for these different species and kind of uh, getting a better sense of what's out there on the landscape. Uh, so for this site, we had 38 plots, a lot of information here, but we had 38 plots, about 1,600 trees record, um, about 73% uh, white bark pine mortality across the site, so pretty significant. Um, and from this, I were able to identify 30 viable pairs of these live and dead trees. And you can see the general species composition here. It's mostly lodgepole pine, about 74% lodgepole pine forest. Uh, but white bark is notable uh, component as well, about 17%. All right, and I'll show you some data from Three Lakes in a second here, but here's just a couple pictures looking at this area. And it's really hard to see from these pictures, but this is a very dy uh, dynamic area. It's very disturbance prone. We have a lot of beetle activity, a lot of fire, um, and a lot of just land use and change in this area. So these are very uh, disturbance prone types of environments. And if you go up on just the ridge, you can see some pretty significant signs of blister rust as well. So this is kind of your classic ghost forest of white bark pine, where we've had significant mortality um, starting in probably about the 30s um, as a combination of, of drought um, and insects and this invasive pathogen, white pine blister rust, which can kind of decimate um, some of these white bark pine populations. All right, my other side is on the western slopes of the Mission Mountains, kind of the eastern side of Flathead Lake there. It's the Boulder site. So this is another high elevation, kind of low intensive land use site. Um, and the composition here is more uh, distributed, so it's about half and half almost between Lodge Pole and white bark. They're kind of the predominant species of this site. Um, but we do have some subalpine fir and some other species as well. And we have about 1,400 trees that we cored here. Uh, mortality is pretty significant at this site as well, about 86% uh, white bark pine mortality. But there's just a lot more white bark here, so we were able to identify 42 pairs of this disease. It's a little more robust of a sample size. All right, and then here's uh, some pictures of Boulder. Again, just trying to show the diversity. This is a really diverse area. In addition to disturbance, uh, you know, fire, beetles, and, pa and these pathogens, the tribe also has some history of uh, logging uh, adjacent to some of this site. So there's some patches within the sites that have a little bit more of a history of, of kind of active land use. All right, so the figure. <laughs> it's kind of always depressing showing a summary figure because you put so much time into them. And then there's like, there it is. Um, all right, here's my, <laughs> here's my figure for Three Lakes, looking at these pairs, so these 30 pairs of live um, and basically, what we have here on the x-axis, or excuse me, the y-axis is a growth index. Um, so basically, one is average growth. Anything below one is below average growth, and anything above one is above average growth. And the orange uh, there is for the trees that ultimately die on the site, and the green is for the trees that are continuing to still be alive at this, at this area. And really, um, what's interesting to me is just the, the difference in growth. So these uh, trees that ultimately died did seem to have a higher investment in growth. Um, kind of throughout the majority of the record, really from 1911 through the 80s. And really in um, about uh, late 80s, early 90s, there was an inflection whereby those dead trees really started to decline in growth and these live trees really started to take off. Um, so when we look at resin defenses mapped onto this, you brought the VR headset, thank you. 
<laughs> Sorry, poor humor. Um, but here's the uh, resident up area. So this is basically looking at the investment of uh, carbon, annual carbon, into resin defenses. And so this dark green line is for my live trees, and this uh, dark orange line is for the trees that ultimately died. And really, to me, what the big takeaway from this figure is that these trees that ultimately died experienced some sort of trade-off. So whereby they invested higher resources into growth at the expense of kind of a more regular investment in defense. So a low, lower overall annual carbon being invested into these resin duct uh, features. Whereby the live trees, although they had lower growth, they had a more regular investment into resin duct defenses pretty much throughout the entire record. And that's interesting to me because that suggests again this trade-off. And kind of my working conclusions based on this information at this, at this stage are that these fast growing, potentially vigorously growing white barks may potentially be more susceptible to disturbance events because they have a lower kind of regular investment into defenses. So that when a disturbance comes through, they may not be as equipped to deal with that via producing resin and mobilizing resin from the sites of injury. Um, the kind of second takeaway that I'm coming with this is that these trees that invest more in defenses more regularly um, are better equipped to survive these disturbance events. So just by, you know, just by investing more into defenses, I'm going to be better defended against a disturbance. So pretty reasonably straightforward. And there's a lot of uh, kind of a growing body of literature that suggests that, re uh, you know, defense is a heritable characteristic potentially. So uh, kind of playing into that, I'm, you know, thinking that managers put, could potentially try to develop strategies that aim to kind of increase or maintain genetic variability across these stands. So if you have a higher genetic vari variability, you're going to have some individuals within that spectrum that are just going to naturally be more defended and potentially increase your overall resilience to different types of disturbance events over time. So there's still a lot to be done. I still have the boulder site that I'm analyzing, so that could change all of this once I get that data. Um, but in the meantime, thank you for all the collaborators and people who helped get this project. So, cool. Last but not least, <laughs> save the best for last. Yeah. The cutest for last. <laughs> Species-wise. All right. So, <laughs> and presenter-wise. All right, so. <laughs> Look at it, they're so cute. Um, all right, so today I'm gonna to be talking about phycos here as we were talking about. And so we're gonna be looking at kind of what are the effects of climate change um, in the last 150 to 100 years um, on this species here in the Northern Rocky Mountains. This photo I thought was kind of a good representation because it does show how these dry, arid conditions and low elevations um, go into a montane forest as they rise up and they end up reaching the alpine zone. Um, so we'll discuss that here in a little bit, um, but hopping right into it. So I study pikas other than their cuteness. Um, so they are restricted to talus, which is broken rock essentially. So they're very, very definitive habitat. Um, you're able to find them via satellite imagery, um, these habitats, and they're not shifting through time, which is quite important for us. So you're able to just pick out whether it's climate, whether it's vegetation. The habitat itself, the rock is not moving up slope with the pikas, um, as it does with forests and other stuff like that through time. Additionally, pikas do have high detectability. If they're there, you know they're there. Um, this is common throughout their entire range. Um, it's typically 95% confidence um, in that. Uh, additionally, we have seen distributional shifts and complete extirpations out of mountain ranges across the country. They do inhibit 11 of the 12 western states. The only one they don't occupy is, of course, Arizona. Um, they do occupy New Mexico, surprisingly. Um, but they are listed as a species of conservation concern, which is similar to kind of saying it's in danger on a local scale. Uh, the two states where it's not listed as a species of conservation concern are Montana and Idaho, ironically, where there is very little research on this um, except for there is a little bit of work up in Glacier, um, and now the Bitterroots as well. Uh, so that's where we're kind of coming in here to kind of start examining what's going on here in the Northern Rockies. And lastly, uh, their evidence of historic occupation does last quite a long time. Most species, if they were recently there, their evidence might degrade pretty quickly. But pikas old hay piles and their fecal pellets can last within the talus buried down deep in there for hundreds of years. Um, there was one site in Zion with Eric Beaver over at the USGS that they car radiocarbon dated back to the 1400s when it was last occupied. And so this evidence does last quite a long time, so we're able to see if they used to occupy this habitat, which is quite interesting. Um, and one note that I didn't put up here is that uh, it's a species that people aren't hunting. Um, they're not really impacted by anything else human-wise. They're not being hunted. Um, their habitat is not being destroyed. Nobody's building a house on talus patches. Um, and so it's important because we aren't having more human influence other than a shifting climate um, for the species. So getting into the overarching question, we want to look at what is the impact of aridity, but also other various aspects of climate change on the species here in this ecoregion. 
Uh, to do so, we have three different measures that we can look at. We have site occupancy, whether pikas are there, if they used to be there, or if there's no evidence that they've occupied in the last several hundred years. Um, population density, which I will not be talking about in this presentation, and then upslope attraction as well. Hopping right into it. Uh, our study region. Uh, most of you are familiar with this area. This is Bozeman up here, the Bridgers. So one of our sites is the tobacco roots there. Uh, we also have the beaver heads over near Salmon, Idaho. We have the Italian peaks, which are essentially a southern extension of the beaver heads. Uh, Lima, Montana, for those of you who know where that is, is right over here. Uh, the Snake River Plain is down here. And then we have the Lemai Range, which is absolutely massive there. And so running from dry to low, or from, sorry, from dry to wet, uh, we have the Lemai Range and then the Italian peaks. The beaver heads are a little bit wetter and the tobacco roots are the wettest that we have. And when we go to each individual talus patch, this is essentially how we're serving. We're gonna be walking 50 meter transects. And so you're gonna be doing this along elevational gradients. So you're gonna walk all the way across for 50 meters. You're gonna go up 15 meters, walk across 50 meters again, go up. And this is important so we can get a measure of density. How many pikas are there per 50 meters walked on the patch? Uh, while walking through the patch, we document all sorts of evidence, whether it's a pellet, uh, whether it's a fresh hay pile, um, or if it's a pika calling or you're seeing it. This is an example kind of again of our methods is we are running these transects that run from west to east up and over these mountain ranges. Essentially we're starting at the valley edge on the west hand side. We hike all the way up to the peak. We survey 12 patches on the way up and then two other people are on the other side of the mountain range on the east side. They're hiking up the drainage. They're also serving 12 patches on their way up and they're documenting whether it's occupied or not occupied and all the other aspects that we're interested in. This is a little bit of an example of some of our results here in the beaver heads. And so these orange patches represent patches that are no longer occupied. The pikas have shifted up slope most likely. The red indicates essentially a patch that had no evidence whatsoever. And then green is where pikas still are currently occupying. So again, our evidence types that we have, so we have current evidence, which if you see a pika, if you hear a pika, there's a pika calling out, they're pretty ferocious. Um, those are current evidences along with the hay piles. They store caches of food for winter time. And so they build these little hay piles that you can see on the talus. Um, and then old evidence, if the patch is no longer occupied, we look for these urine stains, which is this white staining on the rocks. Um, you have old pellets right here. And then you also have old hay piles that can persist for quite a while. Of course, the hay pile disintegrate much faster than the pellets and the urine stains. And here, this is actually the tobacco roots here. Um, this is one fecal pellet, so they can actually be really, really hard to find sometimes if the patch was extirpated quite a long time ago. Um, and for future reference, extirpated is essentially locally ex local extinction. Um, they're no longer occupying this patch. So getting into some of our preliminary results here. Average number of sites, uh, we had about 660 sites surveyed in 2018 alone. I had three phenomenal field assistants with us. The 660 surveyed, about two thirds of them were still occupied. One third of them, surprisingly, was already extirpated. Um, but, and then 4%, about 17 patches had no evidence at all. Uh, however, surprisingly, we had about one third in each mountain range was extirpated already or no longer occupied, which was a bit surprising. We figured we would have had quite a bit more in the lemmas and less in the tobacco roots due to these uh, differences in temperature and climate. This one, this, these are all of our patches that we surveyed. On the x-axis here, we have summer mean temperature. So as you go to the right, it gets hotter. And then on the y-axis here, you have summer mean precipitation uh, at that individual site. These are all pulled from PRISM, um, which is a climate model from Oregon. And so essentially, as you go down to the bottom right corner here, it's gonna be hotter and it's gonna be drier. And as you notice, the red here is extirpations and blue is still occupied. As you move to drier and hotter conditions, uh, patches are more likely to become extirpated. They're more likely unoccupied now. And so we do see this clear trend here. The hotter and drier, the worse off it is for pikas. They're shifting to cooler, wetter conditions. Um, again, with that, is this is a conditional density plot, the probability of a patch being occupied given some sort of condition. So as you move here on the x-axis, uh, you have summer mean temperature. So as it gets hotter, you move to the right, you're more likely to be extirpated. The probability increases of extirpation. Whereas if you're a colder site in the summertime, you're more likely to be occupied. We see the opposite trend here with precipitation. As you get more precipitation, you're more likely to be occupied um, until you reach some sort of threshold where it's actually, uh, you become, you're more likely to be extirpated again. Um, and that might represent those high elevation, severe conditions um, that are really, really cold and really, really wet in the summertime and the wintertime. Um, so sorry, what was that? Did you have a question? Oh. Nope, we're good. Measuring the mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right, we're good. And so the mechanisms we're thinking behind these are that uh, these summer temperatures might be chronic heat stress on the individuals, which might act 
in a multiple different ways. And then with the precipitation stuff, it might be water and nutrient availability through vegetation locally around the patch. And our really exciting figure here, uh, it took way too long to make, kind of as Nick mentioned too. So we have elevation here on the y-axis um, in meters, and then we have different watersheds here. So there's 56 different watersheds that we've surveyed. These orange bars represent how much the species has retracted up slope in each individual drainage. Um, surprisingly, a lot of drainages uh, lost more than half of their elevation so far. Uh, we, in one event in the Lemai Range here, this entire orange one, there are no longer any pikas anywhere in the drainage, um, which is a little bit depressing. And so uh, throughout all the mountain ranges that we are seeing these upslope shifts occurring. And the average between all the ones that did shift upslope was 287 meters, which is just over 900 feet. So they're shifting upslope quite a bit faster than we thought they were. Um, and lastly, this is just all the models that we ran so far. Uh, each of these yellow represents summer conditions and the blue represent winter conditions. As you can see, it appears these are also, these are all ranked of how essentially good they are compared to the other ones. So the best ones here are on the top, down to the worst ones. As you can kind of see the trend of yellow on the top, it appears that summer conditions are more important for these pikas in this region specifically. Winter conditions do not appear to be as important in predicting whether or not sites are occupied. So wrapping up here, so summer conditions appear, as I said, uh, to be more important than winter conditions. That does not appear to be the case up in Canada and some other areas. Um, both temperature and precipitation are important. Uh, other papers have assessed them separately. Uh, we're kind of trying to bring in both of them and seeing the interaction between them. So now the next kind of steps in the research are looking at what about that summer precipitation, what about that summer temperature is driving mm -hmm. extinctions or local extinctions um, in pikas in this region. So is it vegetation mediated? Is there just not enough water in the vegetation for them to survive? Uh, is the temperature directly acting on the animals? They're too hot, they can't disperse the heat. And then is it dispersal related? Can they no longer move between patches to reoccupy them once they go extinct? Um, or could it be some sort of mechanism of ph physiological stress where they become too stressed that they cannot breed anymore? Um, so there's some sort of avenues of future research here. And so coming out of the Montana climate assessment here, conditions are projected to get quite a bit warmer here in the summer which is not necessarily great for pikas. Um, so, but the big takeaway message is this, is that precipitation still matters. Precipitation might be able to offset the negative effects of rising temperatures for this species in this ecoregion. That's all I have. Nick, how about the resin ducks? So more resin ducks, better defense. Uh, if you suggested you might be able to select for something. Would you select for one or the other? Now I'm a forester, I want protection. Yeah, and that's that's kind of one of the tricky things is this balance potentially this trade-off in growth and defense. Uh, but interestingly with resin ducks, it's not just production, it's also size is really important. We're finding that it's area is probably the most important. Uh, so how much the entire area of these ducks. So the live trees are, aren't really producing any more ducks, they're just bigger. Mm -hmm. um, so they can just mobilize more resin. But it does seem to come off, you know, coincide with some trade-off to growth. Um, so that kind of is a challenge if you're, you know, it's a civil culture is trying to, you know, maximize growth. Um, you might run into some kind of trade-off with, with defense in that sense. So is defense easier on big trees or little trees? If you look at uh, areas where you have both big and little trees in the same place, is either better defended? I that's, suppose that's the same as asking, does either have more resin ducks? That's a really good question. Um, and I think ultimately with that, so we have a size threshold at the site, but we're ultimately sampling for just demography. So we weren't sampling anything smaller than 15 trees. Mm -hmm. um, so pretty much all, all the data I'm showing is from 15, I think our max tree is 32, which is a pretty modest range of deviation. Um, but with, with the, the larger trees, the, the more robustly growing, typically they have a, a relationship with just bigger resin trees, more area for resin trees. And I don't know if that's just because they're more vigorous and they're just monopolizing resources better and they're just able to sequester more and then thereby you know, invest more in the growth and defense. Still kind of trying to keep that apart. Um, it'll be interesting to see if Boulder corroborates any of this or if we get a different picture of that on the site. Um, so I'm going to expect uh, the Resin ducks to help a lot with respect to insects. Right. How about how about blister rust? Does it help there too? That research is still kind of 
sketchy on that. Uh, my thought would be that if you can just mobilize more resin, you might be able to, to sector your quarantine off of that, that anchor or that infection, but it's it's hard to say. I mean, most of us can be pretty devastating up there. It happens really, really quickly. So I think a big part of a tree's capacity to withstand that disturbance is having a nice constituent defense and already kind of invested in that tree. Um, Why should somebody question? else have <laughs> Yeah, Nick, did you measure, um, but did you measure um, density around the live and dead trees? Yeah, so it, uh, that's a great question. And we're looking kind of at density right now, but most of the density we have is at the plot level. But at that older site, due to my work with the uh, um, terpenes, we have much more uh, facially. Uh, did you radial? Exactly. Yeah. So we, uh, for that analysis, we actually took competition uh, up to a twenty degree and tried to do our best to document small and large trees that is each. One more question. Oh yes. Um, first of all, thank you everyone. That was really exciting to hear about. Um, if um, have for management practices for related to fire in Chile, have have um, U.S. Suppression approaches been exported there. Has that changed things, or do they have a different way of putting the fire? That's a great question. Um, uh, you know, they the, the Chileans have tried to. Most of their landscape is on contact detail. Elevation analysis. They're trying to put out um, in fire uh, curves essentially. And their resources are, are much, much more. Uh, so the capacity to put out fires is much less, but their attempts are equal in terms of the effort that they do have. You know, they're trying to put out essentially every fire. There's another side of that coin, though, in terms of um, there's a lot of intentional burning in terms of uh, arson. And, you know, the Chileans we work with, you know, Bruce is familiar with this. There's a lot of intentional burning that's more political benefit. That kind of covers this, this uh, suppression effort. So it's widely distributed across the landscape. So people are lighting fires in a lot of places. It's an interesting dynamic. And then this connectivity of like highly flammable fuel. Do they put fire breaks in there now or? Um, I mean, they do have fire breaks and the landscapes are, are fragmented, but there's enough continuous fuel, especially under extreme conditions. So I think the, the fragmentation and the fuel breaks are going to work under moderate conditions. So you get fires cropping up. And, uh, uh, plus two. 2017 and other, even this year, there, when you get extreme conditions and strong winds, uh, there's enough fuel that these fires can be The Chileans are asking the government to get more air tankers. They're like, we need to be the US. We need more air tankers. We need more. And they're trying to say, well, we have plantations that are here in extreme conditions, but not necessarily the solutions. All right, let me tell you.